Um, so how did I start Warren Rocks? Uh, about three and a half years ago, I, I moved back to um, Washington from Afghanistan. I worked as a, a Army Army civilian for a benighted program that many of you have heard of called the Human Training System. Um, and jumped back into the think tank world, was pretty dissatisfied with the tone, tenor, and quality of conversation debate on foreign policy in the media. And a lot of outlets that I had once loved were sort of turning more towards a mass audience. I felt as someone really passionate about the issues that I'm passionate about, and I felt a bit left behind. At the same time, um, being a functional alcoholic, I was having drinks with friends, um, including many who had served in the military, worked in government, um, worked abroad in other capacities, studied things uh, in depth in the academy, and I was learning so much from these conversations. And I thought, why are we not hearing more from these people? These are the kinds of voices I want to I want to hear from. So I started Born the Rocks as an outlet to feature those voices, just really as a hobby. And then it took off, and um, now it's three and a half years later, and we're raising money from investors and uh, building a membership program that some of you might have signed up for. And if so, thank you if you, if you did that. Thanks for this pump in the back there, Jim. And, uh, and we're going to be having some exciting partnerships to announce in the next few months, so things are going pretty well. Um, but it was really an accident. I never intended to go into business. It was never an ambition of mine. I thought I'd work in the government, and then I thought I'd be sort of a you know, foreign policy intellectual type of studying things and writing things. And, um, I worked a little bit in the field, but didn't plan on doing that again. And, uh, and then this just sort of happened. And it was very accidental, accidental. And a lot of people in this room have started things, whether it's in the defense bureaucracy or outside of it. And so I'll know you'll be able to re relate to an analogy I made in our, our three-year anniversary note that starting a new thing is like, I don't have any children, I, I don't think at least, and but it's a lot like having a, a baby, I would think. Uh, it's sort of vomiting all over you and um, shitting all over you and just demanding every ounce of you. And then, just when you think you've like found the right balance, the baby just stabs you with a knife and you don't even know where the knife came from. And um, it's, it's really hard. And, and, but what makes it possible is you pick the right people and you have the right vision and you adjust them both as, um, as time goes on. And, and uh, after I wrote this three anniversary note, a couple people, other entrepreneurs, wrote me and reached out, and uh, a common theme in a lot of their notes was, just be glad you weren't married and you didn't have a family, because all those years where you don't really, don't really know how you're going to pay rent and you don't really know how you're going to meet your financial obligations, turns out it's a lot easier when you're a bachelor. Uh, and you can sort of tolerate that sort of uncertainty and flux. And so for those of you who have started new things, um, without that sort of safety net with families, uh, my hat's off to you, because that's even braver. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the media industry and where Warren the Rocks is sort of fit in on that, fits in there, and where Warren the Rocks is going to head and why. And then I'll just open it up to questions. What I didn't realize is I was starting not just a hobby but a media company. And the, the problem I was responding to sort of unwittingly is that all media organizations, not just those in foreign policy and defense, um, reacted in a certain way to the proliferation of digital advertising. So all this money, billions and billions more each year, was being spent on digital advertising. I think it, it goes up 16% a year for the last few years. And so media companies were looking at this and saying, well, we just need more pages on the site because we want to run more ads, because we want to make more money. And to have more pages on the site, we have to have more content. And to have more content, we have to start letting in people who we normally wouldn't have published before, kinds of content that will just get people to click on it. And so this revenue model is really responsible for a lot of what we all call clickbait. Uh, the sort of thing that doesn't appeal to the practitioner, the expert, the person that's passionate about it, but is perfect for the guys, I like to say, waiting in line for a burrito that just needs something to do with his phone for about 30 seconds. Um, now what's happening is these media companies have sort of destroyed their own revenue model because they put out too much stuff, and now they have a supply-demand problem. They have more pages. Uh, the the, num the amount of content on the Internet is growing faster than the amount of dollars being spent on it, even though it's going up tremendously every year. And so now you're starting to see big media companies not meet their advertising targets. And this is where Warn the Rocks, and there's other outlets like this out, um, out there, really can succeed, is by speaking to a smaller but more passionate, dedicated audience with just better content, which used to be what all media organizations tried to do, is just put out better stuff than everyone else. So it's really not that innovative, but it became innovative because people stopped, were stopping, we're not doing that as much anymore. And so just by putting out better content, attracting dedicated tribes of users who really identify with the brand, identify with what you're doing, are passionate about the people you have involved in. Um, and 
this is really the future of media. And these organizations tend to make money more from their users than based on their users. So they're not going to car companies, let's just say, and saying, hey, we got some people that might buy your products advertised on our site. You're asking the users to uh, support what you're doing, either by some, through some sort of subscription model or, or something else. And so that's really where War on the Rocks is headed, is uh, we just rolled out a membership model that some of you may have seen. We launched on Indiegogo, uh, just sort of as a pilot for this year, and we're gonna launch it for everybody next year. We're gonna be giving our users um, more opportunities to interact with people that are passionate about national security with each other and with our experts. We're gonna be doing that through some gated social network tools as well as uh, weekly webcasts. We're gonna be growing that even more by offering a larger membership down the road for, uh, that will also provide people with extra content that isn't available on the free site. But what I'm most excited about is these databases that defense nerds, which all of you are, whether you admit it or not, will be really passionate about and really interested in, hopefully. Um, so that's generally where things are heading. Um, but the three big lessons, uh, and you could read, read about this in longer form. Some of you might have read the three-year three anniversary note that I published over the summer in July. Um, but the big lessons is you, you surround yourself with the right people, and you get the right people on your team. And there's actually two people in particular who are here I'd like to thank. Uh, Dave Barno and Norm Bensal over here, who sort of made an early bet. Give it up for Dave and Norm. Uh, like what we were doing, made an early bet, and now they publish a, uh, a column that we publish, was bi-weekly now every three weeks, uh, that they could have placed that column pretty much anywhere they wanted, uh, but they chose War on the Rocks. And so you get the right people on your side, um, and you put out better stuff than everyone else, and you try to attract this tribe of users, and I don't think this, these lessons just apply in media. I think they apply in, uh, in bigger ways, particularly when you're talking about the military community, which is more cohesive. You know, There's a lot of temptation in Silicon Valley just to make something that will scale to access everybody and pull everybody in. And there is a lot of money to be made there. You know, the Snapchat valuation news just leaked out today. I'm not saying there's not a lot of money to be made there, but there's also lots of money to be made in targeting smaller, more passionate communities. And that's sort of what War on the Rocks is a part of, but also a lot of other media organizations out there. Um, my friend, good friend Kimberly Jackson, asked me to work her into the speech, so I'm working her into the speech right now. And uh, Kimberly, if you're watching, hi. Um, now I'll take questions if anyone has any. <laughs> My name is Chris O'Keefe. I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, long time War on the Rocks reader. I work at the Pentagon. Um, are you concerned that the shift, and I know you mentioned some of this in your, in your letter, are you concerned that your shift to a membership type model might disrupt some of the growth that, you know, that, that fueled you, sort of the crowdsourced, kind of everyone kind of jumping all in? Is that, and how are you kind of going to respond to sort of some of the concerns? Like even people like the New York Times are facing, as they go on to revenue models, they face readership challenges, people. Mm -hmm. You know, start to move on. Any thoughts? Yeah, and that's that's definitely an issue that uh, we were struggling with um, and trying to tackle. The we the, the the key is is we are not planning to uh, gate our content. So we're going to keep the content, which is really the top of our funnel, free. And that's what brings everyone to the site is the daily free, high quality content. And so the membership is really going to be uh, involved getting more. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what you all want, not just through sort of direct anecdotal interactions, but some of you may have taken our user surveys. Uh, thank you for spending 15, 20 minutes when it was out. I really appreciate it. And uh, just trying to understand what it is people want, people passionate about national security want more of that we can give them. And so that's where we're heading. So hopefully we're not going to be dealing with any of those challenges. Because you're right, if we gated the site tomorrow, people are so conditioned to get their media and content for free. And not just for free, but without any steps in between them going to it. It's one of those interesting user experience questions is, if you put even one step in between, they just want to go read the content, and they have to click on something else, the drop-off rate, even if it doesn't involve them spending money, it's just an extra click. Uh, users are generally fairly lazy, and I, I am too. They just want it right away. And if you put anything in between them and the content, you interrupt it. So the key is, is and it just drops off. So we don't want to have to deal with those problems. So, hope that answers your question. Thanks for reading. Uh, August Cole with a question about journalism and the role of
role that it, it plays or doesn't play at War on the Rocks. Do you ever get tempted to go down that path and, and take the site in that direction? No. Um, yeah, we. So there's a there's that for for several reasons. Uh, one, there are a lot of defense journalists out there who are very good at their jobs, and that's just not our advantage. Uh, I'm not a journalist. I've never been a journalist. I consume journalism, but I don't know how to manage journalists. The other thing is just the simple fact that I can't afford to pay a staff of, of writers. I can't afford to pay myself. But, the, um, but uh, that so it's just a very labor and cost intensive model of content that other people are already doing really well. Uh, so sometimes journalists will submit stuff to us, but we publish it when we do publish it. Not we don't publish their journalism. We publish their analysis that they want to do that isn't just sort of their natural thing based on their experience. Like we're going to be coming out with something by an experienced journalist who lived in Turkey about about Turkey, but we're not publishing him because he's a journalist, we're probably just publishing him because he knows a lot about Turkey. Uh, so no, we haven't been tempted there. Hi, I'm Miriam Krieger, long time War on the Rocks reader and supporter. Um, two questions on adjudicating content. One, um, I know one of the difficulties that a number of folks who work inside the Defense Department face in publishing is the litany of processes for approval and the difficulty sometimes in um, signing your name to something that is perhaps a bit more controversial than your leadership would appreciate. Um, have you ever considered a uh, almost shaky public style uh, column or, or periodic thing that is an anonymous one that is still content adjudicated by you? And second, I'm associated with the content adjudication, how do you go about deciding what is publisher worthy and, and what would be relevant to your audience? Sure, great questions. I'll start with the writers within um, government bureaucracy and the challenges there. Uh, Defense Department, by and large, is really permissive when it comes to publishing. I'll tell you what department is now, the State Department. Uh, we have published very few things by people who act, act currently work for the State Department, and the approvals process has never taken less than six weeks, which, when you're an editor and you're trying to fill your calendar, is not ideal. Um, the, um, but the Defense Department, it's amazing, and no other country has this. No other country just lets their military officers write what they want, pretty much. Um, we have we published something by an um, Army captain. She's uh, currently down at, at SOCOM, and she wrote a piece criticizing unconventional warfare. Probably didn't make her the most popular person at Bragg, but we have a system that allows for that, and I think that's what, one of the cool things about our uh, military. And we talk a lot about negative things about organizational culture in the DOD, but I think that's actually one of the, one of the big positives. Um, as far as what I, how I decide was relevant to our audience, so uh, our submissions guidelines used to basically just say, please don't submit things to us. And that wasn't working. And so it's like, well, if think people are going to submit things to us, let's write something longer. And so we wrote we these very lengthy um, submissions guidelines that a lot of people actually, most people actually were even follow, which is great. But the ideal one the Rocks article is something where the author has special knowledge uh, and special insight that other people don't have. And they either have that special knowledge or insight based on them doing it, you know, if they're going to write something about Syria, it's because they were there or, or over Syria maybe, um, as whatever the case may be, or something they've studied. You know, they have new data, they're a historian that has looked in the archives at this, they're a scholar that has studied this phenomenon. We have this debate going on on the site now about the role of credibility and reputation um, you know, we have one political scientist write something, two responded, we have another response coming around then. So uh, it's just cool stuff by people that have something unique to offer, rather than the sort of standard format that some other outlets have. It's just like, well, I have an opinion and internet connection, um, and I'm a reasonable writer. That's not always, you know, that's not good enough. Um, I, I read those things, and I sometimes find those interesting elsewhere, but that's not what makes one the rocks, one the rocks. And then what was your other? There was one part of your question I think I didn't answer. Uh, just, sorry, just the idea of if you would consider publishing anonymously for people who aren't interested in being the least popular person at Fort Bragg. Yeah, so <laughs> as some of you might know, we recently published an anonymous author on uh, Syria. It's a very controversial two-part series that pissed a lot of people off. It was fairly sympathetic in some ways to the Assad regime and, and uh, sort of Russia's interest in Syria. I don't know if the author would agree with that characterization or not. That was my reading. I was really happy to publish it because I thought it was fascinating and interesting. And I think actually part of strategy is understanding how other people think about things, which believe it or not in Washington is fairly controversial. Um, and people, there were some people um, 
I think a, a small number of people, but, a, but they're very loud, that got offended. I was accused of working on behalf of the Assad regime uh, on Twitter by a prominent, I don't know, a prominent might be too, giving him too much credit, neoconservative thinker. Um, and, uh, and everyone's like, how can you publish this? It's like, well, you all read it. And it sparked this amazing debate because it transcended the do we intervene or do we not intervene debate on Syria? Or is Assad bad, evil, and the rebels good, or vice versa? It was just getting into this tired debate. And sometimes when you allow someone with special insight and experience to write anonymously, and our conditions for that are, it's dangerous for you personally to write under your name, or you could seriously lose your job. Now, the exception to that is we will not let someone write something classified about, you know, I still have a security clearance, I'd like to keep it. Um, it's not just something for you to be a whistleblower or leak something about your office that you're mad about. It's for people that are on the ground or for it, or sometimes all are, so, anyway, so on and so forth. Um, so the one way that we've considered doing this in an expanded fashion is sometimes folks in the military, folks in the defense bureaucracy that are stationed around the world notice that there are certain gaps in our capabilities that if they just got a little more senior leadership attention or could be resolved. I don't want to give any concrete examples yet. We thought about doing sort of like a Dropbox type thing where people can alert us to things like that, that as long as it's not classified or, or confidential. And then we will post maybe a short thing about it. That might be a feature we roll out in the future. Um, but otherwise, not sort of a junky public style thing. So uh, I understand your desire to cultivate a tribe, passionate people, um, but and you, you want to strike a tenor and a tone, so how do you avoid uh, the balance between a tribe and an echo chamber? If you want that kind of tone, you're going to get an echo of that tone and that tenor. I think as long, I think as, long as you, when I talk about tone and tenor, it's more sort of about seriousness and credibility, it's sort of substance over snark. Uh, is really what I mean by tone. Uh, and as far as avoiding the echo chamber thing, we publish different kinds of views all the time. I mean, I, I publish, I, part of what makes Warren the Rocks, like, Warren the Rocks would fail if I didn't publish stuff I disagree with all the time. And not just publish it, but make it, but work closely with the author to make it much better. Um, and so that's how we avoid that, is. Um, I never want us to become the site where, uh, you know, if you go to the Weekly Standard and you see there's an article about Syria, you know exactly what it's going to say. I don't want anyone to ever think that about the one the rocks. I want, if they posted something, it's like, oh, I wonder, wonder what this guy has to, or gal has to say about that. So as long as we're keeping that sort of sensibility, I think we'll be, I think we'll be okay. But it does limit growth, because when you're, it's a bit inside baseball, right? So that does limit the size that our audience will grow to, but that's sort of the point. Uh, Scott Eastman. Um, Going back to the, the Syria article example, yeah. do, you, do you think that um, someone like you or someone that owns a blog, a podcast, is at a serious disadvantage because if, let's say, 60 Minutes runs that article or, or the author of that article, there isn't such this, there's going to be opinions either way, but it's different because it's still from that traditional media mindset that that's a trusted source, or at least we think we trust it, right? There's always going to be two sides to that. How do you still overcome those tensions in the the big media versus, and I really like the work that is that you put up. Uh, I'd rather go to your work than 60 Minutes. Thank you. Um, how do you compete with those tensions and being relevant and having people um, view your content as trustworthy, even though it may not be something that they truly believe in or it's a different way of thinking? I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. I understand the question. To tell you the truth, it's um. Could you try phrasing it another way? Traditional journalism. Although not a professional organization such as taking an oath, there still is an ethics about it. Yeah. Um, the blog sphere, the startup, um, and I, I won't call you a media company, that's not what you are, um, but putting out this content, there's a, there's a certain level that people don't quite believe in the relevancy of it. Is it, uh, um, I haven't really talked yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, I think I get it. I don't think that's a huge problem for us. Um, we are a media company. I embrace that. We're a different kind of media company. We are not. We are, we are not a blog. Um, but uh, not, which is not to say anything negative about blogs. But the, um, I don't think it's a big problem for us. It, what really establishes our credibility and reputation are the people we get to publish. 
And uh, what's interesting about One Rocks, when I first started it, it was just a group of about 30 regular contributors. Um, and it just sort of snowballed. As people started seeing, hey, they're publishing smart stuff, it's a credible outlet, I want to join in and get involved in that. We try to make, we don't always succeed at this, but we try to make it the best editorial process possible. Our editorial process is very different because um, none of us are journalists. Uh, all of us are, everyone that edits your article has either worked in the government or is an academic, um, or both oftentimes. And uh, so that makes the articles better in a way that journalists of other publications might not be able to do as easily. Uh, and so the credibility really flows from the kinds of content we publish. And so when we publish something super controversial, like the articles we were just talking about, I think people are willing to give us the space to do that because they know that we're a general credible outlet. Uh, so it's not a huge, huge problem for us. Anyone else? Hi, Clark Kelly. It's kind of a related question, but I, I guess I, I interpret that as it can be unclear to, to new uh, readers like what particularly is is the, the scope of your agenda or the, the, the width of, of views and topics and ideas that you're interested in. And so how would you describe to someone new what it is that, that you're about and what types of, of substantive discussions you're interested in, in fostering? Yeah, so the standard line I use is digital outlet on strategy, defense, foreign affairs that publishes content by current former military, and current former government, and scholars. Um, experienced, authentic, authoritative voices. I think one of the areas where we can improve is the website we currently have, while I think it's very pretty, uh, there's some limits to it for that new user that just arrived. And they're like, well, there's some articles here, but what are they about? And I think our site, and that's partially user experience and design question, could do a better job of uh, introducing new readers to who we are and sucking those new readers in. Um, that's, and that's something I think a lot about. Alex, do we, I don't know if you really want that, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, Ryan, so I'm, I'm actually gonna sort of pivot this back to you. Where you started to talk uh, about when you, when you opened this up, there a lot of the questions recently have been about, you know, uh, the, the content on Wall and Oxen. My question is, more about getting back to where you started. You're an entrepreneur who didn't know that you were starting a business. And so in terms of lessons learned over the last uh, three and a half years, I'd like you to just you know, sort of open up and unpack that a little bit more, especially the, the things you've learned over the last, say, nine months in particular, as you've uh, yeah. made this pivot. Don't do what I did is the first lesson. <laughs> uh, know what you're getting into. Um, <laughs> Something I wish I did more, there are two things I wish I'd changed, aside from, I can't change the fact that I didn't know where it would lead, um, which is part of the charm, but also created a lot of hurdles. Um, but the two things I wish I did was find senior mentors early on, not just people that knew a lot about defense. I'm really lucky to have uh, mentors and friends who were older who really helped me on those issues, but people who could mentor me on starting an organization and a business. And I think that really would have been invaluable, particularly in our first year. And I didn't, I didn't even think to, to do that. Um, I had an advisory board and from fairly early on, but they were mostly people who were around my age or a little older, and they've been tremendous, they've been amazing and tremendous, but I really could have used to sort of a very senior kind of mentor there. And that's something that I think is probably transferable to a lot of the stuff that you're all doing. Um, and the second is, I wish I just made an effort to talk to other entrepreneurs. When you're an entrepreneur, at least my experience was, when I first started realizing that's what I was doing, I was starting what would become a business. I'm like, I don't need to talk to other people starting businesses. They're trying to start other things than me, or maybe they're gonna be competitors, or I don't wanna tip my, tip my cards. Or, uh, those were all bad instincts. And, you should be constant, and that's what's great about death, and it's one of the values here, is you get to talk to other people who are facing the same challenges of starting things, and if you don't think they're the same challenges, I mean, how many people can identify with parts of the story that I've told in starting their own things? Uh, show of hands, I mean, a lot. So these are all transferable things that we should all, I should have talked to my peers a lot more than I made an effort to. Um, those are the big, big lessons, I think. Hey, Ryan. This is on. There we go. Hi. Uh, well done, thanks for this, and uh, good job without scotch there. Um, <laughs> my, actually, my question does, I think goes really well after Jim's, which is you've, thanks for these uh, lessons that you've learned from, from your first three years. Uh, as an entrepreneur and thinking ahead, what lessons do you think you're gonna learn from the next three years? So the, so my, my uh, 
saying that I like to repeat the most on business, which isn't really necessarily worth anything yet, but um, is if you're successful in business, you're trading old problems for new problems. And if you're not successful, you often get stuck with the old problems. Uh, I'm, you know, we're, we're about to be faced with a lot of new problems, uh, working with partners in a more direct and robust way, um, having a membership platform. So uh, managing staff, we're gonna be hiring staff over the next few months. So there, these will be all these new challenges, uh, managing an organization, uh, and dealing with tech things in a much more in-depth way than I've had to beyond just sort of website design. Um, so those are the big ones. It's going to be tech-related, people-related. I was talking with Pete Newell last night. Is that we, you know, Pete started this amazing business and all sorts of projects that you're going to hear about later this afternoon. Um, and the commonality in it, and I know this will resonate with most of you, if not all of you, is all major problems at the end of the day, of the day are people problems. Even technical problems are people problems because you haven't either you haven't found the right person or you haven't managed that person correctly or you have not given that person what they need to succeed. Even if you think it's just a technical problem, it's actually a person problem. So um, I look forward to and dread all the new people problems that are ahead of me. Um, Welcome to Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, we might. All right. We're, yeah, we're we're actually over time. So that perfect ended right on right on time. So thank you, Ryan. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it.